Grab your Bibles, turn to the book of Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, starting at verse 12. I'm in a series that will go for three weeks. Today, it'll begin, it'll go next week, and then it'll end on Resurrection Sunday. Mark, chapter 14. The series is entitled, Empty Life or Empty Tomb? My subject this morning is the Passover. Next week, I'll talk about the praise. And then on Easter Sunday, I'm going to talk about the power. So today is the Passover. When you go to Bible college, oftentimes they will teach you what's called alliteration. It's easier for people to understand something when you use all same letters, things of that nature. It's just a learning tool. I'm very much that way. I use tools like that because I want to help you get it. Also, when I teach, I want to give you points that you can refer to because I have enough rabbit trails I go down. I want to make sure you have some substance to refer back to when we teach. I'm going to look at three things this morning as you're taking notes. I'm going to talk about the preparation, the prediction, and then the Passover out of passages found in verses 12 down to verse number 26 this morning. Helen and I, a number of years ago, this is the introduction just so you know, you can look at me for a little bit. We're honored to go to Israel. We loved Israel. We would go at the drop of a hat if we were invited and somebody paid our way. <laughs> As I said to you last week, I love the Jews. I love the nation of Israel. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. In fact, one of the chief rabbis just stayed at my friend Ken Gobb's home another a number of times in Yakima, Washington. Chief rabbi from Israel, not U.S., from Israel. So we have a deep passion and love for the things of God and especially for the nation of Israel because we believe God wants to do great things for the nation of Israel. So we were there on a trip with Ken, and he puts on, I believe, one of the best tours that anybody out there in the business does. Everything's turnkey, and I'll just put a plug in for him. You'll not lack for anything because you'll have everything from your departure city back to your departure city uh, in terms of, of excellence and quality and hotels and food and accommodation. And also you get, you get Israeli guides, not Arab guides. In fact, his guide is Dov Friedman, who is the general in the Israeli army, former general in the Israeli army. You get to places that not everybody gets to go to. You see things not everybody gets to see. So we were there, and we were slated to go somewhere else, but I remember waking up. You ever wake up one of those times, you go, what's going on? Something's not right. You ever have one of those days you wake up, something's just not right. You wake up, and it's like, what's going on? And the reason I did that is because I've been in so many different world cities that when you travel outside of the United States, you, there's a, a, a cacophony of noise that you arise to every morning in a major city. And so in Israel, it's no different. I remember waking up, and it was silent. I go, something's wrong. I said it to my wife. I said, something's not right. I got up, and I went, and I opened the window. And amazing enough, I looked out the window, and here was snow on the ground in March, which is, huh? Four inches of snow in March, which is a very rarity during that time in Israel. And I was shocked. And how I knew something was wrong, because I didn't hear the noise of the horns honking. Because in most cities, the horns are honking constantly, the taxi drivers, beep, 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 they're zipping in and out, and they want to know that you're there. And, you know, they don't get irritated by it, it just goes with the territory. So beep, 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 I says, man, something is wrong, something's not right, get out, we notice. Well, our plans changed that day. So rather than going on our bus trip that we're supposed to go on to, we all got down to breakfast, and we had to, we had to change the game plan, it began to be a punt. The punt was that day, we're going to the upper room. So we made a mile march in the snow. Helen's feet got frozen. I had to warm them up in the bathtub later. But we marched all the way to the upper room. We go to the upper room. We hold a service there. It's a great time of celebration and remembrance. I don't think probably many of you realize that the upper room where the Passover was held is probably the very same room that the outpouring of Pentecost was at. Most theologians and scholars believe that it was Mary, the mother of John Mark, whom we talked about last week. It was in her house that this supper took place. Now, as we develop this teaching, it says this, point number one, the preparation found in verses 12 through 18. On the first day of the festival unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. By the way, that's not normal for a man to carry water. Because the women carried the water. I'm sorry you can do the whole chauvinistic thing and all that, but in their culture, men just didn't carry water. The women did it. And before you get all high and mighty about me, I just want you to know, I clean the house sometimes around our place. <laughs> I wash the toilets around our house sometimes. I clean the sinks around our house sometimes. So anyway. 
So it was the woman's work. That's why it would be unusual. It says, follow him and say to the owner of the house, he enters. The teacher asks, that means rabbi, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So it would have been something that more than likely he had set up in advance. And the key was this guy would be the tip off. Follow him. When you see him, how many that's an anomaly? When you see a guy carrying a pitcher of water, it's not normal. He's the guy. Follow him and then go after him because he's going to take you to the place, the upper room. It's going to be prepared for us to celebrate this Passover, which we celebrated this morning as the communion supper. Verse 16, the disciples left and went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. And when evening came, Jesus arrived with the 12. And while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me who is eating with me. So I want to end it at verse 16. I went in a little bit too far ahead. Sorry about that. So it's 12 through 16. And we're talking about the preparation. How many of you know if you're going to do anything, it takes preparation? You don't just decide, decide one day, well, we're going to go camping and then just go and jump in the car and go somewhere and you don't have a tent, you don't have food, you don't have a stove, you don't have any of those things, you don't have any sleeping bags. Some of you know you're not going to camp very long sitting in that situation. Okay, You may be sitting in your car freezing somewhere along the night because you didn't think of the things to bring. That's not preparation. In fact, the motto of the eagle, of the eagles, the motto of the Boy Scouts is what? Thank you. Be prepared. Always be prepared. And so there was a preparation. I'm going to tell you, Jesus did not fly by the seat of his pants. Look at me again. Just because we're Holy Ghost people doesn't mean we fly by the seat of our pants. Jesus didn't. He said, make preparations. Why? Because this festival has been kept from the time that they came out of Egypt. And I want you to go with me to the book of Exodus as we take a look at this this morning. Exodus chapter 12, if you would please. Start at verse number one. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month of the first month of, of your year. And tell the whole Israelite community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamp for his family, one for each household. Which day of the month? Which day of the month? 10th day of the month. The month of Nisan, which would be March or April, depending on the lunar year. By the way, the, the Jews follow the lunar calendar, which is based off the moon, not the sun. By the way, the Bible says in the book of Genesis that the Lord created the heavens and the earth. And it says in the first day, he says there was the evening and there was the morning the first day. In the Jewish culture, the day begins with the evening, not the morning. So that means that sundown, that's when their first day begins. You all still with me? Okay. Then he says, if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. So how many of you know some people eat like birds? If I went out with some people, I can tell you what, if I've eaten out with them before, I can tell you what their level of eating out is going to be because based on history, some people eat like birds. They don't eat very much. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell on Joyce and Lloyd. When we go out with Joyce and Lloyd and we sit down at a table, I don't care where it is, I will ask Joyce, what are you eating? And it may be a bowl of soup. It may be an order of French fries. It may be whatever, but she eats like a bird. Now, I wish I could say the same about Lloyd, but I'm no, just, just kidding. <laughs> Lloyd's very modern and he's eating, trust me. But Joyce, any of you that have ever eaten out with her, she eats, very, she eats very balanced diet. I mean, very light diet, if you want to know the truth. So it's in accordance with what they are able to eat. Then he says, the animals you choose must be year old males without defect. Everybody say without defect. And may take them from the sheep or the goats and take care of them until the 14th day of the month. So on the 10th day is when you select them. However, what happens on the 14th day is when you kill them. And when the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight, that's right at the evening of the next day. Okay, it says, when the members of the community of Israel slaughter them at twilight, they're to take some of the blood, and after they put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs, that same night they're to eat the meat roasted over fire along the bitter herbs and the bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roasted over fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it until morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. 
This is how you're to eat it with your cloak tucked in your belt and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. I'll come back to the scripture in a little bit. So everybody say preparation. He's saying that there needs to be preparation and anticipation of the Passover supper. He knew something that as a boy growing up from the point that he could remember that every year they would eat this celebration because it reminded them of the exodus of God's deliverance from the nation of Egypt. By the way, which is a type of the world. And when they crossed the Red Sea, it was a type of baptism. Is there anybody with me here today? Just like it's a type of your baptism as they begin to move towards the promised land, which was Canaan land. I submit to you, Canaan land does not represent heaven because there is no battles in heaven and when they went into canaan they were to kick the giants out of the land do i hear an amen canaan represents the beulah land that you and i are to receive of as children of god in the here and now because john 10 10 says the thief comes to steal kill and destroy but i've come to give you life and that life how more abundantly super meno it means above hooper meno it means above and beyond it means the quality of life that god lives that's the kind of life that we're to live do i hear an amen so if we're not living that quality of life we've got to say god here's your provision here is your your promise. And Lord, what do I need to do to inherit this promise in the here and now? I'm going to kick the giants out of my land. Is there any giants in your land today? Is there any giants in your health? Any giants in your finance? Any giants in whatever area of life? It's up to you to say in Jesus' name, I'm coming against them in the name of Christ Jesus of Nazareth. You not have part in my life and my family any longer. That's preparation. They were moving to Canaan land. But he says, get this thing ready. You need to get everything ready as you begin to process this. Now, you understand something that uh, during this time, Josephus, the historian, writes and says, more than likely, there could have been about 265,000 lambs all killed at the same time by the priests and the Levites. That is a lot of butchering. It's a lot of blood. There are churches today, you would walk into their building and they don't sing about the blood There's no songbooks about the blood. They don't want to talk about the blood because it's not cool. It's not not something that people today talk about. It's uncouth. It's not right. But I'm telling you, the Bible's very clear. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. If Jesus didn't die on Calvary's cross and shed his blood, there's no remission of sin. So all of those lambs that were slaughtered from that time until Christ came, it all depicted what Jesus Christ would do on Calvary's cross. All the ritual, all the sacrifice. They had to be clean. Now, here's another thing that you might note. Every male Jew who lived within 15 miles of Jerusalem had to come to Jerusalem for Passover. But many more came from the great distances around, including Galilee. And many who who had heard about and saw Jesus in the region of Galilee now had come also with great respect, expecting great things. Josephus again says that more than likely, two million people would flood into the city during this time of Passover. Two million. That's a lot of folks. Now, the first time I went to Israel, I was there during Ramadan. Ramadan is the highest holy days for the Muslims. Did you know that? By the way, the third most holy site for the Muslims is the Dome of the Rock, that golden covered dome right there. And so what happens is during that day, it became so crowded. We wanted to go back to to the Temple Mount. We couldn't get there because there were so many buses clogging up because of Ramadan. All the Muslims that go and they bow down prostrate up there. I'm going to tell you, there's coming a day. Are you hearing me, saints? There's coming a day that there will be a restoration and that property that the old temple site was built upon will be restored to the Jews once again to the glory of God. Do I hear an amen? Amen. And they will restore their temple worship as they anticipate the true King of kings and Lord of lords. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. So this whole thing of what happened, as they would walk in, what they would do is they would prepare. Here's how they would prepare. They would go through in any place where there was a tomb, they would whitewash it. You remember when Jesus says, you're nothing but whitewashed sepulchers? The reason was because they would whitewash the tomb because you couldn't defile yourself by walking by and touching that on your way to Passover because you'd defile yourself. You'd have to go through ritual cleansing. So they wanted to make sure that you didn't defile yourself by touching that whitewashed tomb. That's what would happen. So it was a marker on the way there what was taking place. So preparation is huge in this thing. In the same way in our lives, we are preparing ourselves because we're anticipating the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, His return for us, the Bride of Christ, that we're going to rule and reign with Him forever. The Bible says in the book of Peter that anyone who believes like this cleanses himself from those things that would bring stain and defilement. And you say, well, how do you know the Lord's coming? Because Jesus said He was coming again. He also said that when you see earthquakes, famines, uh, he says when you begin to see wars and rumors of wars, all these things that his redemption, he says lift up your head for your redemption draweth nigh. Now have you know we just had another earthquake in Chile, an eight point something. LA had one the week before, five point something. 
something's brewing. I'm going to tell you something. We're in upheaval right now. Now, I personally believe that Jesus Christ could come at any time. That's my personal belief. And, I, and even if he doesn't, you got to live like that. You live in anticipation of that. So preparation. So they're prepared. Number two, as you're taking notes, there's the prediction. Go back to the book of Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. Take a look, if you would, please, at verse number 19 down through verse number 21. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve, and while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me who is eating with me. Now remember, when they ate, they didn't sit down at a table. Anybody seen Da Vinci's Last Supper, the painting of Da Vinci? They're all sitting at a table. It's not accurate. Okay, because it was not correct. They would have a U-shaped table, this upper room where they were at. They would have gone up there. They would have laid down all around, and they would have leaned on their right sh- arms like this. And there's a table low to the ground, and they would eat like that. On this side would have been John, the apostle, the one whom Jesus loved on his right hand. On this side would have been the seat of honor. And guess who sat there? Judas Iscariot, the one who was about to betray him, was sitting at his left hand in the place of honor. Interesting, isn't it? So they laid down. Now going on, it says this. And it says, uh, and he says, truly, I tell you, one of the, the one of you will betray me who is eating with me. And they were saddened by the one, and they were saddened. And one by one, they said, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Peter and John across the table, surely you don't mean us, Lord. Others, you don't mean us, you don't mean us. He says in verse 20, it's one of the 12, he replied, one who dips his bread into the bowl with me, the Son of Man will go just as it has been written about him. But woe to the man that betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. It was customary for them to have this bowl in the middle. It was sop, and in the sop would have been this liquid. It'd be like a broth, and they would take their flatbread because they wouldn't have leavened bread. Remember, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is joined in this service called Passover. For seven days, they would celebrate this feast, and before what they do is they would go in to the house, and they would make sure the head of the house would do this, so men, you're not off the hook. How many of you know God works through headship? And if it's a single household, whoever the parent is, I don't care if it's a mama or a daddy, you then become the head. So we're not excluding anybody here. The head becomes whoever's in charge by virtue of headship. Okay, so moms and dads, if you're a single parent, you're the head. If you're a wife or your mother and you're in your 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 uh you're a single mom, then you become the head of that household. But a head would come, and they would go through, and they would look in all of the cupboards, and they would sweep out all the bread with leaven, and no crumbs. This is how serious they were about this. Why is this? Because Paul says it's the whole piece of leaven that will leaven the whole lump in 1 Corinthians 5. How many know leaven is influence? Everybody has influence. Influence can be good or it can be bad. Smile at me real big. Influence can be good or it can be bad, depending on what kind of influence that's there. Everybody talks. We just want to be talking about the right stuff. If you begin to talk about the wrong stuff, it becomes wrong leaven that leavens a whole loaf, and he relates it to the church. Paul says to the church at Corinth, if you don't deal with the leaven and put it out of your fellowship, it's going to leaven the whole lump. And so they would go in beforehand, they would get rid of all the leavened bread because there was no leavened bread. That means it did not rise. It was flat bread. Now, I love going to East Indian food. I go in there and I walk through the buffet in one of my places in town. And I will put on my rice base. Then I put dal on top of it. Then I'll go through and they have something that's like uh, onions, deep fat fried. Not really too probably healthy, but it tastes really good. <laughs> then I walk on through. And then I get my, my, uh, my chicken. It's, it's the, uh, what is it? The tandoori chicken. They, they oven bake it in the clay pots. It's awesome. And then I will take the chicken masala and put that over my rice as well. Then non bread. Non bread reminds me of tortillas. I love tortillas. I don't have them very often because they're not good for your belly. Trust me. But I could used to sit and I would I, I'd go when we go on holidays to my families, the Taurus is all in South Dakota. We'd go there and the family would make tortillas, my aunts, and they'd build a stack this big and they'd put them like in, in like uh, hand towels to keep them warm. Then you'd take them out, you'd take them open, you'd slather them with butter and pour salt on them. And baby, that's the way you eat a real tortilla. <laughs> Delicious. I'm telling you, if I lived like that, I'd be roly poly. I'd be, I'd be like my aunts. My aunts were four foot wide and four foot high. That's true, is right. But non bread, it's flat. Why it doesn't rise? It tastes great. They would take it, they would dip it in the sop, and they would eat it. And Jesus says, The one who dips in the sop with me is the one that will betray me. And so he does this, and I'll take a look here. It goes on to say this, and it says, uh, verse, verse number, it says, It would have been better for him if he would not have been born. Now go back to Exodus chapter 12. Don't lose your place here. I want to go back because I told you I'd go back there. We're talking about the prediction of the one that would betray him. 
Verse 12 says this, On that same night, what night? The night that you celebrate the Passover. In the same way that they did it clear back here in Egypt, now they're celebrating it in the same way. He says, when you do it, be standing with your clothes on and ready to go. When they were doing it, they were reclining. Why is that? Because when they were ready to go out of Egypt, they were going out of, out of the world. But he says, when they were doing it, they were reclining. Why? Because Jesus is coming. We're at rest. Now, rest does not mean we don't do anything. Some people say, well, you know, we just rest and I got to take a break. There's more to it. He says, occupy until I come. It's an imperative tense. It means it's ongoing. We're doing something about the king's business. All right, here we go. Verse 12. On that same night, I'll pass through Egypt. I will strike down every firstborn of both the people and the animals. I'll bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign. Everybody say the blood. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This day you're to commemorate for the generations to come, and you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. A lasting ordinance for seven days you're to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly, and one another... And one another on the seventh day. Do not work on all these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. So we recognize what he's saying. He's establishing something. And that's the prediction of what would happen and take place. Now, how do you know it's happened? Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, has been seen. He is celebrating this Passover. What he's doing, he's alluding to himself about what's going to take place. All of that pointed to him. Now go on, point number three. Point number three. Go back to the book of of Mark chapter 14, look at verse 20 through 22 through 25, and it says this. This is the Passover. So we have number one, the preparation, verses 12 through 18. Number two, the prediction, what? Judas' prediction of his betrayal, that he would betray Jesus Christ. And then finally, it's the Passover, verses 22 through 25. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. We did this this morning. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says this very same thing. He says in Isaiah, in fact, 700 years before Christ comes, he prophesies what would take place. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. I'll read it for you as a reminder of celebrating what we did this morning. It says this, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are what, everybody? Healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us turned his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who for this generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, no deceit was in his mouth. Hung between two criminals. Died in Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man's tomb was buried there. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through this, the Lord makes his life an offering for sin. Do you see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. Say, I've been justified. Look at somebody say, you've been justified. How did he do it? By the blood of him. It's by his blood you've been justified. He'll bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. He will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto the death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. All right, I'm back at Mark chapter 14. So Jesus, once again speaking, says, this is my body. If we take it, if he gives it, we've got to do what? We've got to receive it. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to all of them, and they all drank from it. Go to the book of John, chapter 6, please. John, chapter 6. Trying to bring connectiveness to all of this together, how it interweaves. John chapter 6, verse number 53. Actually, start at verse 52. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, Very truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have not, no life in you. Some churches believe that it becomes the actual body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's called transubstantiation. We don't believe that. We believe in consubstantiation. It represents symbolically that which is in terms of his flesh and his blood. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood is eternal life, and I'll raise them up at that last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, remains in me, remains in me, and I in them, remains in me. The word is meno. It means to abide. It means to dwell. It means the tabernacle. It means to hang out with. I'm telling you, if there's anybody you ought to be close with, it ought to be Jesus. It ought to be Jesus. It ought to be Jesus. It's remaining. Now, there's a thing about partaking. We partake at least once a month, but that doesn't mean that's the only time you can partake. I mean, you know, you can partake every day if you so desire. You don't need a priest solemnizing the ceremony. You don't need somebody like me that, that, uh, that, that, that serves sacraments. How many of you know, in fact, in, in legal jargon, it's called the sacerdotal duty, that we as, we as preachers uh, are called to perform sacerdotal duties. That means that we then can be right with the state and all that kind of business. How many of you know, it doesn't take that. Any Anyone can partake of communion on their own. You have direct access to the Father because of Jesus Christ. Do I hear an amen? You don't need a priest. You don't need an intermediary. You have access, James, to the Father through the Son. He just says, when you partake, partake worthily and deal with your stuff. The reason is because you have to deal with your stuff. The Lord loves us too much to leave us in our sin. He says, when you partake, let a man examine himself to make sure he's worthy. It's a point of contact that if we got sin in our life, we need to take care of it. Are you hearing me? So we can't go on indefinitely just wallowing in this stuff. That is not healthy for anyone. God wants you to deal with your junk, and the sooner the better do I hear an amen. It's time to move on and be the man or woman of God that he's ordained you to be. Hallelujah. So it says then, going on in this passage, whoever eats my flesh, this is verse 55, for my, my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink, for whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me, feeds on me, feeds on me, will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Everybody say, Jesus. Jesus. Your ancestors ate manna and died. How many of you know manna is no more, folks? And whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. What bread? The bread is Jesus himself. It's him. It's the Logos word. It's the written word. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Do I hear an amen? He said this while teaching in the synagogue of Capernaum or Capernaum, as they say it there. He says, if you're feeding on me, you're going to have life. This Passover points to everything Jesus fulfills, that everything that the Old Testament Jews were doing and celebrating in ritual, at that some point, what happened is Christ fulfilled that. And so today what we celebrated is what that which they would celebrate with the bloody sacrifice, like I said, of about 265,000 lambs to accommodate these people that were there to be able to eat that and to, ha and to have the blood flowing. And I want to go back to what I said earlier about the blood. So there's too many people who say, we don't want to talk about the blood. Let me tell you something. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You better talk about the blood. It's the blood that purchased your life from sin. Hallelujah. It's the blood, it's the blood, it's the blood. Let me tell you something. You ever cast out a demon, they know about the blood. Because when you begin to declare the blood of Jesus Christ, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over you. Come on, somebody. They know whether you have authority or not. I remember sitting in a living room with a guy who just the night before had driven, driven down the freeway, had a head-on collision, killed somebody, manslaughter. He was going to be facing jail time. I sat in his living room across the right like this from him, and I began to talk to him about Jesus Christ. And I said, you need to get Jesus in your heart. And as he accepted Christ as his Savior, Lord, all of a sudden the demon in him began to manifest and it manifested like a wolf. He took on wolfish characteristics. He began to growl. He says, oh, that was just make-believe. I'm telling you, it was the real deal. But as I began to exercise the authority and the name and the blood of Jesus, come on, somebody, that demon had to back down and I led him through deliverance. Not only did he get saved, but he got delivered in that place, sitting in his living room to the glory of God because they know about the blood of Jesus. It's the blood that redeems. It's the blood that sets people free. It's because of his blood you're made whole. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We need to talk about the blood, not shove it under the carpet. Well, that's a bloody old religion. Yeah, it is. It's a bloody Christianity because Christ paid the price for us. Hallelujah. We don't compromise that whatsoever. Now, looking back here once again at verse 24 of Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. He says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many. He said to them, truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine, until the day when I drink it 
new in the kingdom of God. Now, a number of cups had passed by. This was the final cup that he gave to them in this celebration as they came to the end of their ceremony. So they would have, had, they would have eaten bitter herbs. They would have eaten unleavened bread. All of that was pointing to Old Testament and what had happened and transpired. The unleavened bread, as they had to carry it because they couldn't have it in their kneading troughs, they had to be able on the move. So that's why they couldn't have leavened bread. The bitter herbs because of the bitter pain that was taking place in Egypt. Because it's a reminder that you don't want to go back to that. Come on, somebody. You don't want to go back to the world. It's bitter. You don't want it. And then they got to the place where the final thing was they would celebrate by eating the Paschal Lamb, which represented Jesus Christ. And he says, them, I'm not going to do this again until I meet with you anew in the kingdom. There is coming in the day. Listen to me, saints. I believe, I believe that Jesus will come for a church. He's coming for a church triumphant. He's coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. That's what my Bible says. That's why we're in preparation. We're in training for the reigning. And the reigning is for, for thousands and thousands and millions and millions and eons of years because in, in eternity there is no time. But we're going to rule and reign with him. We'll start off in that first thousand year period of time. And it's called, the, it's called that time of the millennial reign. We'll rule with him there. But there's coming a time that we're going to be in an indefinite period of time. But Jesus is going to come for a church and we're going to rise up and meet him in the air. And what's going to take place is we're going to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. And once again, he will partake of this particular uh, particular right and he'll do it with all of us that have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb his blood that was purchased for us so is it an empty life or is it an empty tomb i don't want an empty life i want a full life and i want to have an empty tomb because of what jesus christ did for us on calvary's cross look at verse 26 and i'll wrap it up with this when they had sung a hymn this is my conclusion when they had sung a hymn they went out to the mount of olives went across the kidron valley boom went over to the mount of olives that's where he spent the night. He didn't go to Bethany, but he spent the night over there on the Mount of Olives. We know that he went there, and it was in Gethsemane where he then was uh, arrested and tried. And Judas, who had sold him out for 30 pieces of silver, came and led the guards there. You say, well, what, are they, what is the hymn? What did they sing? You know what they sang? They sang the Halal. The Halal is the chapter of Psalms 113 through 118, and it's all about the deliverance from Egypt. In fact, if you went back to Psalms 113 through 118, they would have all known this. I can think of times when all of us as kids had grown up knowing children's songs that we learned from children's church. Well, I can't say that it's always the way now. It used to be this way. You could almost go anywhere and know that they would sing this. But in Psalms 113 through 118, it talks about coming out of Egypt. 114 says, when Israel came out of Egypt, Jacob and the people, they would have chanted this. They would have sang it. Think of the songs that we sang in Sunday school that if I began to sing, you'd probably all chime in because you'd heard them somewhere, somehow. It'd be very similar to that. As they marched off, they walked, and they began to praise the Lord. Yeah. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Ain't going to let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Ain't going to let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. And so on and so forth. Well, you may be a little rusty, but you picked up on it. <laughs> My point is this, is that Jesus knew what he was doing. He knew he'd be betrayed. He knew he'd give his life. And it represented everything that had built up to that moment in time that was fulfilled in that Passover. He was the Passover lamb. We celebrated today the bread and the cup, the Passover lamb, Jesus. It anticipates the day that we'll celebrate it in the kingdom. We're looking forward to that day, anticipating it, but in the meantime, receiving the benefit of what it means to us, sin saved and forgiven, and then healing for our physical body.